Hi, today I want to get into expanding my instruction from 8 bits to 12 bits. In video 52, I discovered I had a problem being able to fit everything that I wanted into that 8 bit instruction. And the lowest four bits I was going to use for determining what was going to assert onto the main bus. And well, it turns out that that just wasn't going to be a great solution. So I expanded in that video to 12 bits, and today I need to make that a reality on the build. But first, I owe an update as to the EEPROM that I built in the last video. And it's not really an EEPROM, it's really SRAM. Uh, but it's being used as if it was EEPROM with a battery on board in order to save the data after it's been written by the programmer. And so let's get into that. I want to I want to show you the update of that first. And I don't know how that's worked out yet. I haven't uh, done anything other than test voltage to make sure that it was still well over three volts. And it is. It's been a little over eight days since I walked away from it. And now I'm back. So let's get right into that. Hi, my name is Adam. I'm building a 16-bit computer from scratch. I hope you'll join me on this journey. Okay, as you can see, I've got the build out up here. I've got it pushed up out of the way so that I've got room to test this. And I want to show you that for eight days, I still have a good bit of voltage here. So 3.18 is still a very good voltage on this battery. That being the case, my expectation is, is unless something has gone horribly wrong in my design here, the data is still intact on here. So let me break out the Tommy Prom and get it set up. And there's the Tommy Prom. And we'll figure out how we need to wiggle that into the, uh, the slot here. Remember, this has got a design flaw in that it doesn't quite fit into the socket well, so I have to kind of work my way in with it. Let me switch over then to see how that works, see what the data looks like. All right, so remember from the last video, the last thing I did for the first, I want to say 512 bytes, is to write AA into each of those positions. So let's dump the memory and see how that worked out. And as you can see, uh, the, that memory has held. It has been static in this SRAM for eight days. So I'm gonna call that reasonably successful. Now I need to get it onto the breadboard and use it the way that I would normally use it and see how that works out. I'll give you an extended test, but all signs right now are looking really good that this EE prom replacement is going to end up being a good solution. Okay, I think it's probably fair to anticipate a question of how much this is going to cost and what the bill of materials is. I've got it up on the screen here, and my total cost, if I was to buy everything today, would be $16.39. A couple really expensive call-outs here. First of all, the turned pins. Uh, I happen to have those from a previous purchase that I decided were absolute junk. And since I'm planning on keeping these mostly in a breadboard after they're assembled, I figure that's probably a good use for something that I am not going to use otherwise. Another call out is the prototype board. Uh, you may be able to get those cheaper depending on what your source is. The SRAM as well can probably be obtained more cheaply, but I am looking at what a reputable vendor would cost for these things. Your mileage may vary if you decide to source those elsewhere. And you might save some money too. The rest of these are really just pennies to pull together. And then of course, I'm assuming you've got wire and solder and heat shrink tubing for some of the other things here. Okay, so... Let's get into the meat and potatoes today. To convert this from an 8-bit instruction, currently the 8 bits of the instruction are here on the instruction register. They're picked up before the instruction register itself is latched to give the ICs enough time, the EE prom enough time to decode that. And then I've got these four wires which are coming up to these demultiplexers which ultimately end up indicating which of the actual registers or what gets to assert to the bus when. These will have to be now driven off of some other piece of logic, but this needs to go away. Ultimately, these four bits need to re be relocated down here before the latch so they can be part of the decode logic for this EE prompt. Now, to do that, right now I've got or bits 8 through 11 here sitting at bits 4 through 7 of the address of the EEPROM. 
And what I'm going to end up doing is moving them up here, uh, taking these four bits, which are bits 0 through 3, moving them up to take their place, and then creating another four bits, which are going to go here, uh, to take the lower four bits. Now that means that I'm going to need to take bits 8 through 11 and now bring them over here and get them tied into the address lookup of this IC. Now, looking at that, it's not quite as easy as I would have it. So chip enable is here just to the left of the bit 7 of the data. So that's going to stay where it's at. Then I've got bit 10. Then I've got output enable, which is tied low. It's going to stay where it's at. And then the next three are bits 11, 9, and 8. So there's four of these six lines which are going to end up being replaced with pins and to do that what i've got is this little contraption that i've made up and it's fussy and it's going to then plug into here and then drag over here where i will hook up each of those individual lines associated with each of these lookups so that's going to be the other part of this address bus lookup here now a word about these connections here um these are sockets that have right angle pins in them intending to drop into the breadboard obviously not in a power rail but in the different data positions but drop in there here's the thing is that if i'm going to drop this in here in place of the ee prom which i need to do at least one of those i need to have some room under here to be able to get to the rest of the pins and the only way that's going to happen is with a right angle as you can see i've got a bit of an overhang here let me grab my pointing implement i've got a bit of an overhang here and this overhang prevents me from putting a standard header here i think i can get this moved down here which should give me the room i need in order to get this dropped in but i still have the overhang problem back here give me a few minutes let me get a, a good majority of this done and i want to demonstrate just how fussy it is to get this put together because it's it, it it's fussy Okay, I've got the digital microscope out because my overhead camera can't zoom in to the point where I can get this kind of resolution. I've actually got the digital microscope zoomed out as far as it can go so that we can get a decent picture of what I'm doing here. So these are all right angle pins and they're all connected together using, using this uh, plastic, I assume it's ABS tie to hold them at one tenth of an inch pitch and what i've done is i've taken my wire cutters and separated them into these individual pieces here and then what i do is i pull let's see if i can do this here i pull the piece of plastic off such that i have these pins here and so these are what i'm going to use to connect into the breadboard now to make the connection to the actual ribbon cable i use these sockets and the key here is that I slide this pin into that socket and I don't know if you can just see it right there the tip of the pin is actually just coming out and the key is to get that right to the point of that indentation there and it is fussy to do so it is just if you can see it it is just to that point there I got four of these to do Okay, next up I've got this heat shrink tubing and I've cut four of them because I'm going to need to be able to cover up the ends of these connectors to make sure that they don't short out with each other. I'll get to this little one here in a minute, but I've got four wires here of ribbon cable and what I need to do is I need to strip down one at a time to the point where I have just enough wire exposed that I can get it inserted into the end of my connector here i'm going to get my handy dandy device and get this prepped here and then i can without uh, messing up my twisted wires here 
insert this in, crimp it down, and then I get to pull the heat shrink all the way up to the end here. And that allows me to uh, then create a, a, an electrically sound connection here such that it won't short between any of the other pins here. A little bit of uh, heat, which just warms up quick. Heat shrink tubing. And that's one done. I have three more to do. And now the other side is generally the same, except that it's pins instead of sockets. And the only thing I'm going to do is add this little tiny piece of heat shrink here on this end. It lines up with the red on this end so that I can keep the cable straight. And this little teeny tiny piece of heat shrink is there only for visual reference. Other than that, that's it. I just do pins just like I normally would. So... Let me get that done, and then we'll be back to hook this last one up. Okay, let's get this installed. So the source for all of this is here. And again, I've got the red indicator to towards the least significant bit. And then it's just a matter of plugging each one of these in appropriately here for control ROM 1. So that's bit 8. Next one over is bit 9. Bit 10, not the next one over, but the next one I want to grab is bit 10. But that's up here in between chip enable and output enable. And then bit 11 is the last remaining one in here. And it's that simple. I want to get my homemade EE prom in here and I think I'm going to stick it here for control ROM 1 and why that one because it's the closest to me I don't know I don't necessarily have a good answer as to why but I do want to make sure that I get these pins lined up correctly it's going to be a bit of a challenge to do yep there we go all right so that's in there so I can use that I just need to program it first and the last thing to think about here is all of this then was related to what was coming off of uh, the least significant bits up here. Remember that was where this cable was pulled to. And now I have to find some place up here in the e in the control ROM to determine exactly how that's going to be. For that, I want to make my next steps in code, not on the breadboard. So let me get that pulled up so we can decide where all of those signals are going to land. Okay, so I'm looking here at my control ROM code. In control ROM 1, which is this one right here, has two unused bits down here. But one of the bits that I actually need is included in this ROM already. And that is uh, the most significant bit of what gets asserted out onto the main bus. So this could be reused or relocated, what have you. Control ROM 2 up here has four unused bits. So if I got desperate, I could take the four bits from this one and use the existing bit up here. So that's a possibility. Control ROM 3 up here as six unused bits, but dragging those lines from here down to here doesn't go seem like it's going to be very neat to me. And so I think if I move my ALU instructions to another ROM and relocate this instruction assert suppress up here to bit five, then I have the five bits that I need to pull this down all as one continuous unit down here. And I, th whoops, it really would be from this one. And so I think that's going to be the way I'm going to go. And what I'll do is I'll pull these instructions, these control signals out and move them to a different control ROM. Let me get the changes done to the control ROM logic, and I will come back and show you what I've got. Okay, before I get into the code change here, I realized I had allocated room for 32 different devices, but in reality, I was going to at some point in the future have an additional 10 or so devices that are going to be asserting onto the main bus, and that's going to be reading statuses off of any of these control or any of these devices. 
uh, I needed to make sure that I took that into account now as well. I have the potential of expanding that to have instru instruction items in here. For example, clear carry and set carry are both active low signals, which could very easily come off of a demultiplexer as I've got set up. So I may end up dropping a couple of instructions in here if I want to get picky about using every potential possible signal or if it might save me any EEPROM in the future. I may end up dropping some things in there. I'm not going to worry about it right now. I'm going to uh, save that and bookmark that for future. But I did need to make sure that I had room for these control signals here. With that said, I have improved the size of the font to make it a little bit easier to read as I get into this. And then here I've got really column of pixels that shows blue is something that I've changed and I've managed to update all the comments here to make sure that everything is current. Now for bits 5 to 0 so that's 6 bits now instead of just 5 what I did is I went ahead and I added a main bus assert for each possible device that could be putting data out onto the main bus and you can see it takes up more than one page here and then those are those control signals that where I will at some point in the future be pulling status and putting that out onto the main bus so that I could read that into a register. With that, that's all eight bits of control ROM one taken, but you will also notice that my instruction suppressed now needs to get moved to control ROM two. So I need to make that change and pull that together. And then my clear carry and set carry are easily moved to program ROM 2 simply because I haven't got that in permanent wire yet. I've just still got those in temporary hookup wire. So that's going to be a relatively easy change to make. And then I had to update my fetch assert main define if you will or constant if you will so that it represented the change in logic there. All the rest of the code down here did not change. So that actually proved to be a relatively simple change. And now all I have to do is go and update the breadboards to reflect these changes. And what makes it really easy is now I know exactly because of the tracking that happens with Git, I know exactly what changes I need to make. Much easier to do it this way than it was to do it on the breadboard first and then try to sort it all out. I would have been back here regardless. All right. Let me switch over and I will start making those changes on the breadboard. I'm not sure these changes are very significant. I think the hardest part of this is going to be bringing the five signals down here. Okay, that's that said, let's start with the set carry, clear carry, and instruction suppress. Now, currently, those are here with control ROM 1. If I scroll up here, I've got a diff here of what was changed. So what was removed was clear carry, set carry, and then the instruction suppress, instruction assert. Those are now down here where they were added in green. Starting with set carry, that went from bit two of ROM one to bit one of ROM two. You're following me, right? All right, so this comes up here to, this is bit zero, there's bit one, and then clear carry was right next to it. It comes right up here to that location. So that now takes care of the wiring related to the carry flag. The other one is instruction suppress. Now instruction suppress, there was an issue uh, when I was doing some testing related to this, and this control signal here coming off the flags was not being delivered in time to actually suppress the instruction properly. We ended up with a pretty bad race condition here. So what I'm going to do is this is the line here all the way down here for instruction suppress. That is the control signal for it. I'm going to pull it out of the, here and just stick it into a an unused row and take this temporary hookup line and then instruction suppress is coming up next to my clear carry up here and yes I have those all three in a row so now that then allows me to remove this this comes off of control one and ultimately I'm going to need to move this or remove that I should say do I do that now yep I do it now because there's, it serves no purpose anymore and it won't be there when I get back around to it so I'm just going to get a step ahead I'll plug that down there in a self-contained loop. No, nope. I'll tie that low because that will do absolutely, is that's output? That's not, that is output. So I'll just un remove it altogether. And then I'll remove this 
four gig. The other change here is bit five indicated which address group I was going to. And that was going through these, actually really this exclusive OR gate. And that should be this signal here. Now while I can leave that in there, reality is, is I've already pulled it. <laughs> so that comes out and then bit five. So this is seven, six, five. We'll come down here and become bit five. That's bit five. Let me just double check this here. Nope. I'm looking at zero, one, two, three. So that's really four. And I'm getting my name, my nomenclature incorrect here. So now, ultimately, what it boils down to is five, four. Three. Two. I'm not going to work. And I've got it incorrect here. So let me double check this. That's bit zero. Is it going to go there? Bit one, bit two, bit three, and bit four. So five bits gives me 32 different permutations or 32 different choices that I can assert. And those are the controls I have here. Now, what comes off of here, I am going to need an inverter. This signal here was buffered or inverted. I'm sorry, buffered or inverted. And it was going off to one of these output enable signals on these two ICs here. And ultimately what I need to do is tie this together with this signal here. To do that, the challenge here now becomes sorting this out. Now a one becomes an inverter, a zero, is a buffer so this was an active low i gotta think that through okay i walked away to have dinner and the solution to my problem here is really stupid simple i take the most significant bit here and plug it in where the old one used to be this takes care of all the logic for me already so it's just literally a matter of leaving that there and quite frankly this wire that i pulled out was probably the exact wire I need to keep. Okay, I think I need to take a minute and try to explain my confusion here. The prior implementation had four bits coming from here to this position here, which has four bits. The fifth bit came out of control ROM one and was bit five. Here's the problem. I used to have five bits, I now have six bits. The six bits are numbered zero through five, and I'm confusing the bit numbers associated with all of this. Ultimately, and I like to say that a lot apparently, but what I have here is these four bits are exactly the same. They're just coming from a different location. This fifth bit, bit four, got that right this time, is exactly the same, but coming from a different location. Bit five, the sixth bit, hasn't been wired in yet and that'll go to another selection of demultiplexers probably out here somewhere when i get to it so the bit count and the bit numbers identifying which bit is which i wasn't keeping them straight properly and therefore i wasn't identifying them correctly and that's where the confusion was coming from okay it's time to give this thing a test I've gone ahead and compiled the control ROM programs and written the binaries onto the three EE proms here. I've also replaced the program here, uh, most significant bytes and least significant bytes, with the Larson scanner from video 42. And it's time to plug this thing in and give it a test. So let me get power back, hooked back up here, and plug power in. And let's just see what happens if we let her rip. After reset, where's my reset button? And that's not working. So something's not right, and I'm pretty sure it's in the signaling, and I'm hoping it's not associated with this, but it's gotta be the first suspect. So let me pull that and rewrite the regular EE prom and see if I'm my problem is here or if it's somewhere else. Okay. Control one has been replaced. Let me reset this back down and same problem. So that's at least a good sign for this. It's a bad sign for this. All right, 
that's my move. I'm moving bit one. And my latch is not working. I don't have a main bus display. But it probably means I'm not asserting out onto the main bus since that's where all the changes took place. I'm not asserting out onto main. Well, it's late enough. I think I'm going to call it for the night, and tomorrow I'll come back around and do some debugging on this. Forgive me, I've managed to pick up a bit of a ick overnight, so if my voice sounds a little rough, well, it is, uh, and I apologize for that. Okay, as usual, when I walk away from a problem, the solution comes to me very quickly. And it dawned on me that I had just changed the instruction from 8 bits to 12 bits, but I didn't actually complete all of that work in my control logic. Specifically, what I neglected to change was not only the comments, but the actual size of this instruction. And in order to do that, what I really need to do is I need to load up my assembler's architecture file and lay them side by side here. Okay, hopefully you can see that. Now, my no-op, which used to use those two nibbles in the middle, those eight bits in the middle as its instruction, has now been extended to the full 12 bits. So what I need to do is for the no-op instruction, I need to add an extra zero on the end here. For this move into R1 and an immediate 16 value, this needs to be turned into three. The jump to an immediate 16, this also needs to be turned into three. CLC has a zero added on the end of it. STC, set carry, has a zero on the end of it. And then the move, the program counter into R1 has an F added to the end of it. Now what that does is that expands my instructions out to the 12 bits where they need to be. And just a quick update of the comments. And then down here, I need to properly separate the top bits from the bottom bits. I don't believe I'm doing this right um, because it should be 15 bits. Yeah, 15 bits of, of instructions there. I don't think there's anything more I need to do, but I guess we'll find out by testing. Okay, let me get those programmed onto EEPROM and replaced back in the build, and we'll give this a test again. Okay, I've got my custom EE prom replacement put back in. I added a set of sockets to the bottoms of the pins, and that actually allowed me the extra clearance I needed to more easily get that into the Tommy prom. So that was a good find there. I've got everything else reprogrammed onto this, so let's go for broke. Okay, reset, and still not working. Perfect. I guess I got to start getting some signal diagnostics out here and take a look and find out what's going on. Okay, here's my logic probe. Okay, here's my load instruction. And I step that up, which latched properly. My bit zero goes up here, but I'm still not asserting onto main. So what is really low, 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 low. So those are all three low. And then this should be low as well then. Okay, so that's there. What's latched is what matters, not the input here. So that's, so let's reset. So this now should be high, high, low, low, high. Okay, so that's correct going in. Okay, I still have a software problem. So let's go back and take a look at that. No, it should be, yeah. Over here is where it should be. It should be one three. 
none of this is one three so yeah i'm interpreting that incorrectly somewhere along the line let me find that and i will be back to you okay you won't believe it but all i did was recompile uh, made a change recompiled the program made a change to the comments of all things recompiled the program and the data started showing up in the right spot so i reprogrammed the eproms let's see how that works let's go again for broke here let's reset I'm getting my main bus latches or main bus asserts, but I'm not getting my, yeah, I am getting my latches over here, but I'm not getting the right value. That's because I'm not progressing beyond this. So I still have some things to sort out here. So my program counter is not incrementing the way it's supposed to. Interesting. Where's my control signal for that? That should be here. Could I have pulled it out and all the hardware work I was doing? Increment. Let me see here. I'm getting a decrement signal here. Increment and then decrement. That should be and latch. It is and latch, but I'm getting a decrement. All right, switching back over here, I see that bits five and four on control ROM two are load and load increment and decrement as well as do nothing. So zero, zero, one, two, three, four, so seven, six, five. That's why. Look here, I've got my instruction suppress sitting right up over the top of that code there. So another software bug. So all of these need to move down one. And now I've got to check the hardware, make sure I set the hardware up right. So bit one, bit zero should be empty, bit one. I believe those are all correct. Let me write that again. Okay, let's try this one more time. So let's reset. So I missed the first latch. But that is working better than it was. Far better than it was. Yeah, just missed the first latch and I don't know why. Yeah, there's something with that first one. But it shows up when I'm running in manual. Well, that's certainly a good thing. That also means that at least in the short term, my EEPROM is working. Now, the battery itself's not getting hot. The None of the components on here are getting warm at all. So I think I'm well within my limits there. I'm gonna make a note of this first LED not showing up properly. Let's turn that way down. Yeah, oh, there it is. Yeah, if it goes slow enough, it's doing just fine. Yep, it worked that time. Missed it that time. Worked that time. So I've got something going on I'm not sure about. But I'm not going to solve that in this video. I'm plenty happy to have this all transferred over to a 12-bit instruction. And so the next thing I need to do with that is, at some point, I'm going to redo my actual instructions themselves. What I am going to do is I'm going to turn this, the power off on this overnight, but I'm going to leave this in the circuit. So that means the battery may end up draining overnight trying to power the rest of the circuit. Uh, remember, there is some leakage that does happen here, and so I may have to figure out how to solve that. I've managed to get the address updated to 12 bits from 8 bits and it's mostly working. I do have some concerns with that LED that's dropping out in the beginning, so I need to research and get to the bottom of that. But this video is getting a little bit long as it is. So let me wrap that up here. Uh, it's, I know it's a little unceremonious and I apologize for that. I did manage to get a bit of a cold as I was recording this and it's taken a little bit longer to get this video out than I had anticipated. So I apologize for rambling a little bit. Uh, when we come back, I will be soldering up one of these PCBs, and I'll walk through all the different issues that I've got with that. Thank you. We'll see you soon.